Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Spring Think House programme for 2021. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, after all the long, dark uh, lockdown days of the last couple of months, it feels really good to be waking up in the light and seeing the sunshine and the birds singing and, uh, and smelling the flowers during the day. It's really wonderful. If any of the children weren't at school, we could share all that with them. Um, that's all, only a joke, of course. Just, so many people are pleased to see the back of their children for a while. Um, uh, this is a first of uh, a series of uh, four uh, Think House uh, webinars. Uh, we'll be looking at um, data sharing. We'll be looking at human rights and governance and, and customs and duties later in the programme. It's fair to say that when we ran the uh, Think House programme uh, uh, this time last year, it was our first fully online programme. And although it was uh, well received at that time, we didn't think that uh, by this time it would have become the habit and the norm uh, one year later. Obviously, some things have changed from the old format. I don't need to show you where your fire exits are or ask you to set your mobile phones to stun for those Trekkies out there amongst you but there is some housekeeping um, this is a curated uh, discussion via webinar we've allowed an hour uh, we'll be taking questions along the way uh, and afterwards uh, and if you have a question please raise it with me directly via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen sitting there in the middle of the bottom of your screen and I will marshal them accordingly we can take them on the way through or we can take them at the end as well the webinar is being recorded uh, and uh, we will share the link with you after the event, either for you to review or to pass around your colleagues. Please feel free to do that. At the end, we will be asking for some feedback on this event and very exciting, looking forward to the possibility that we might physically be back in the office for our autumn series. We'll be running a quick poll, if you please, on how many of you would be likely to attend a physical event. However, some things uh, remain the same despite the new format. We do aim to deliver our loyal audience high quality speakers. Yes, that's you, Jonathan, uh, covering a mixed diet of regular catch ups and interesting topical subjects that we think will impact your day to day or are useful in providing a wider context on significant legal trends. Today's topic is COVID-19 and how it will impact our relationship with our workforce and future working practices. In common with many businesses over the last few months, we've had to face a host of challenges as we've had to adjust to changing markets, resourcing challenges, welfare needs and stretched corporate cohesion. Normal practices once taken for granted, in particular, the central office as a place of work are being called into question or reinvented. Remote working has changed the way we interact with each other for better or worse as this seminar demonstrates. And even now we're looking to a future where on the one hand we face demand for significant flexibility, both locally and from a distance. And on the other, the need to retain our ability to train, supervise and develop everyone effectively and generate esprit de corps. To explain some of the questions falling out of this changing environment, I'm delighted to be joined today by Jonathan Chamberlain, star of Stage and TV and partner in our employment team, who is helping not only many of our clients address these issues, but also helping advise our own organization on how we respond to this environment. So Jonathan, what do you think are the biggest issues you're coming across so far? Uh, I think there are, there are probably three, but before I go into them, Michael, just picking up on something in your introduction, can I just put in a, a plug for the blog written by my friend and partner, Jane Fielding, which we'll, 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 we'll give you the link in uh, the follow-up email, which we send from this webinar. But Jane has some really interesting thoughts on why it is good for us to go back to the office as a society. Um, and they are, as usual from Jane, both unique and insightful. So if you already follow our looped in blog, uh, you will already have seen them, but if not, please look out for the email. So back to your question, what are the biggest issues so far? Um, well, the issue that's making the biggest noise is uh, the idea of compulsory vaccinations for employees, no jab, no job. Uh, but outside of uh, certain sectors, healthcare, 
social care being obvious ones. That's not really an issue yet. It may become one later on, but at the moment it is more noise and media excitement than practical reality. Um, the most questions that we're getting at the moment are uh, about coming back to work. Can people stay away? Can we require them to come back to the office? And my own view, although this isn't an issue which has yet come up, but I think is a bit of a ticking time bomb and it's connected with that uh, pressure to return to the office. Because when we start pressing people to come back, then I think employers are going to find out about some of the new and remarkably effective ways their managers have been learning to harass their own people through the medium of a video camera rather than in person in the office. And, and I think that there is a bomb there waiting to go off. Do you mind dealing with the um, uh, no jab, no job? I know you say it's sound and fury uh, signifying nothing, but um, but is it really? Surely it is an issue in some respects. Well, it, it clearly is an issue in some sectors. Uh, uh, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But most of the noise around this is being generated uh, by people like, well, people in particular, Charlie Mullins at Pimlico Plumbers, who has said that all his plumbers will have to have the vaccine or they won't have a job and he's prepared to take this issue up to the Supreme Court if necessary. And I think uh, me and many other employers wish him all luck with that. Um, it would be excellent to have the law clarified in this area. But the reality is as to where we are now is that until we have universal adult vaccination, then outside of healthcare and social care, uh, it is very unlikely for any policy by an employer saying that in order to keep your job, you must have the vaccine to be lawful. Now, um, just breaking that down a moment, if I may. Uh, firstly, that's clearly not the case for uh, healthcare and social care. And the reason for that is, is twofold. Firstly, it's easy to build a case for compulsory vaccination in sectors where people have no choice but to have close physical contact with the people that they're caring for. Social distancing does not cut it in a hospital or a care home. You have to be up close and literally personal with the people that you're working with. There are no alternative measures that can be put in, put in place. And people in health or social care are very vulnerable. We have seen the damage that this disease does in care homes in particular. So uh, for an employer in the care home sector to say, before you join us, before you work for us, you must have had the vaccine is on the face of it lawful, a reasonable requirement. Uh, and also probably for them to impose it on their people who are already working for them, because you have to distinguish between uh, new recruits and those already in work. It's much easier to impose a requirement for somebody who's joining you than it is for somebody who's already there. If they're there, you are changing the contract as opposed to entering into a new one. But the second reason, uh, not just the need for uh, vaccination, is the availability of it. Because of course, people working in healthcare and social care were amongst the first priorities to get the vaccine. So if you're in those sectors, you can get the vaccine. Whereas of course, at the moment, you can't necessarily get the vaccine. You and I can have it, Michael, because we are of a certain age. Uh, I get mine on Thursday, all being well. But you can see immediately that a policy that says, well, before you work for me, you have to have the vaccine is discriminatory on age grounds. <laughs> because if you're younger, you can't get it. Um, you can also see that an, an uh, employee who is uh, with you and refuses to have the vaccine might do so on the not unreasonable principle that, well, actually, I think teachers should have it before plumbers to pick an occupation at random. And then you're into issues of uh, if you dismiss them for failing to, to, to take the vaccine, are you, in fact, dismissing them for their belief, which leads you into territory of unlimited damages? Now, so I think it's it's highly unlikely that uh, in the next few months you will see employers 
trying to enforce these policies. And I think one very, two very important points to, to remember. Um, taking a vaccine is invasive. I mean, it literally pierces the body. So for an employer to be able to require somebody to do that requires quite a high threshold. We don't, for example, make the flu vaccine compulsory uh, for uh, employees now, although interestingly enough, for example, for long haul airline pilots, they are required to take malaria tablets. Um, so you, you, it can come in, um, but it's very rare. But the second thing is in the COVID regulations themselves, the government has not taken to itself the power to make vaccination compulsory. So the state can't do it. So you have to query whether and in what circumstances a private employer would be able to do it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Um, obviously, I'm I'm only 27, so I've still got a a long way to wait for my uh, vaccine. But um, uh, but if not jabs, much of what you're saying doesn't seem to apply to compulsory testing. Is is this is the rule different for compulsory tests? Um, I think here it's a more nuanced position because the compulsory testing is not so invasive for a start. Um, and you don't start to get into issues about whether people have religious beliefs around whether they should be tested or not. Um, where you can see in circumstances where you're saying it's compulsory to have a vaccine, you can run into discrimination arguments. But, but with test, there may still be those arguments, but there'll be fewer of them. Um, however, however, Again, we start from the point of view that it's, it, it is still an invasive procedure. It's not as invasive as a, as a needle in skin, but taking a lateral flow test is pretty unpleasant if you've ever done it. Um, and uh, the standpoint I think to come about this is, is it really necessary or there are there other things that an employer can do? So for those of us who work in an office environment, uh, will social distancing work? Would compulsory mask wearing work? Is it actually necessary to have people tested? Are the tests effective? And that's even before you start to get into the data protection issues, for example, around what are you going to do with this data once you've got it? How are you going to make sure people have done the test properly if they're doing it at home before they come into the office? What realistic protection is this offering you? And what's your benefit from it? So if you're dealing with just the office environment, that's one thing. But if you're dealing with an environment where people are having to have close contact with the public, so, for example, I can see uh, in theatres um, uh, or other areas where large numbers of the public are going to be uh, gathering in close proximity, you can begin to see how an employer could justify requiring employees to take a test beforehand. But it's going to be very, very case specific, very site specific, very job specific. I would say with that, it's, it is more possible it's possible now as opposed to um uh, uh issues around uh, no jab no job which i don't think are really going to come in practical consideration until we have universal adult vaccination and then you'll be doing the same sort of uh, balancing exercise looking at alternatives etc but that will be very fact specific okay and um you you mentioned on, on your way through sort of beliefs well, what about the uh, the anti vaxxers uh, are they are they protected in law well there's a nuanced approach to this michael uh and that is to say that a libertarian belief that the state should not be able to require people to uh stick a needle in themselves is a respectable opinion and as such it should be uh, respected and that's a reason for people to have not uh, to refuse the vaccination um, then that needs to be treated in the same way as a religious belief. Um, I'm not sure that I would go that far actually. Um, I would place that belief in the same category as I would a belief that having the vaccine means that you are being controlled by Bill Gates or George Soros which is to say that anyone who believes that can quite frankly in these circumstances get in the sea, um, or to use the technical expression, it is not a belief worthy of respect in a democratic society. I do not see employment tribunals as having any sympathy 
with the out there anti-vaxxers. This is all some sort of globalist conspiracy. They may have some sympathy with uh, uh, the libertarians, but I think not much. So I mentioned airline pilots, uh, 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 but again, that is a situation where it is clearly accepted that if you are flying long haul into malaria zones, you need to take the medicine for the protection of you, for the protection of your colleagues and your passengers. And I think in the uh, situation we're faced with now, that tribunals are going to say a, a belief that, that I shouldn't take this on principle is not one that's worthy of being upheld. But, but I can see an argument around that, around the, the, the pure anti-vax is not a chance. Did, would you mind going back briefly to uh, the lateral flow test? We've had an interesting question in from uh, RT Vadira saying, well, you don't make it compulsory, but you recommend. And, and you know, given the sort of balance of power between employer and employees, are there any concerns around the sort of implicit pressure about an employer recommendation that you take um, lateral flow tests? In principle, no. In practice, there are recommendations and there are recommendations. There are offers that you can't refuse. Uh, I, though in principle, I think a recommendation is a good balanced way to do it. And I, I, I think that the, um, or at least my impression of, of seeing people around is that the, uh, largely we have as a society pulled together on this. Of course, there are people who ignored the regulations, et cetera, et cetera, but most of us keep with them most of the time. And I think a properly communicated, it will help us to help you if you take these tests policy uh, is lawful. Um, if it's a backdoor compulsory testing, then that's another thing entirely. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, you know, probably the big question, and especially as we as we all start to feel the relief as we, we're perhaps seeing some light at the end of end of the tunnel, will will employers be entitled to require everybody to come back in? Hmm. The short but incomplete answer to that is no. I think the world has changed. There's a facile answer which says that every employee has a section one statement which specifies a place of work. And it is most unlikely for most of us that that place of work will be our kitchen table or our home or wherever. It will be the office, the factory where we worked before. Um, uh, that uh, section one statement could have well have the force of a contract could be the contract so our starting point is there's a contractual requirement that this is where you work so in theory it should be just as simple as saying okay we're back to work now your contract says you work here you work here it is a reasonable and lawful instruction for me to require you to come back to the office and I think even after the first lockdown that is a point which had some force. The first lockdown was a temporary emergency measure. And someone had said, well, it's clear the world has changed and I don't need to, to work in the office anymore. And my contract has changed. Uh, would, be pushing, would be pushing it. But as you said in your introduction, none of us envisaged a year ago that we'd still be in this place. And actually, we're still going to be in this place for several months to come. So I think there is an argument that the term in the contract has by implication changed. Because in many cases, it is clearly not necessary for people to be in the office. So I think simply pointing to the clause is not going to be enough. It has some force but not as much as it used to have. And so uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the longer answer to your question, can we force people, um, can we require them to come back to the office? Uh, we can ask, we should have 
uh, if not evidence, at least uh, a cogent supposition that people should come back into the office. So, uh, for example, with some research based organizations that, that we work with, they are able to show the slowing down in the pace of projects that has come about after people have been working from home. There is a correlation. And that correlation is strong enough, it seems to me, to say, we need you back, as opposed to, we want you back. Similarly, in professional services firms, um, we've noticed that work has drifted upwards, that, that because we can measure that, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, juniors are not getting the experience that they, that they once did. And that correlation, it seems to me, is enough to say, no, we need you back, as opposed to, we want you back. So that establishes our policy, and then we have to apply that policy to individuals and look at their individual circumstances. And, and here is where it gets tricky because uh, many people will have found that working from home really suits them. They personally are more productive. Uh, uh, their performance, their individual performance will have gone up because that has happened. And it really suits them to be at home. Things that were once sources of immense stress and difficulty. The fact that the nursery shuts at six o'clock on the dot. You know, the fact that um, if you're not there to pick up your child from school, um, do that two or three times, <laughs> you get an automatic notification to social services. You, know, you don't have that pressure if you're working only a couple of streets away from the school or the nursery. So people could now say, we've got a, it's a massive benefit to us working from um, uh, home and we, we want to be able to carry that on. And, and if you're then requiring people to come in, uh, you, you start to get into issues of um, uh, indirect sex discrimination. I want to stay at home because it's easy for my childcare. Childcare, it's universally recognised as a burden which falls more on women than men. You therefore have a policy which uh, disproportionately impacts on, the, on somebody with a protected characteristic and you then have to justify it. So you're back to why do we need you to come in? And why do we need this policy? So I think it has to be handled sensitively. And that's even before we start to get into the issues of is the workplace safe and the necessary communications that we're going to have to do around uh, 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 telling people it's okay to come back into the office. We've done all the things that we need to do to make this a safe environment for you. How does that play um, with Jane's argument in her blog? Because you've got to balance here between the individual need individual benefit and the corporate benefit where as i understand jane's argument she would say there's a very strong emotional corporate cohesiveness morale building esprit de corps reason why everybody should come into the office how do you how do you play that out? is that one of your policy arguments you can deploy absolutely it is and jane's argument is actually one uh goes beyond that uh and is, is probably not of immediate practical relevance to um, uh, any one employer, but is to employers as a whole, um, which is that um, in, in the workplace, things are evened out um, uh, and we have to interact with people who are not like us. We're not able to sit in our, our, our silos, whatever forms those silos, be it race, be it class, be it um, sex, be it religion, we have to mix and that is a good thing for a society but it is also a good thing for an organization and, and i say in professional services we can measure it because we can see the flow of work going up um, senior lawyers are more busy than junior lawyers in these circumstances but um, uh, it seems to me that, that even if you can't measure it um, you have that reasonable cogent supposition uh, that, that, I, that, that i mentioned at the start that that a cohesive organization is a better functioning organization. And I'm sure there are lots of business school studies that, that, that back that up. And if you can say that physical presence is an important part of achieving that cohesion, then you can ask for it. Um, uh, we may all need to be more creative about how we do it. So perhaps uh, not simply relying on the Monday to Friday, nine to five, but having days where everyone has to be in, or actually the residential 
may uh, make an appearance, which, I mean, as an employment lawyer, um, I would thoroughly welcome because of all the things that go horribly wrong on residentials. But uh, as organisations, we may have to start looking at these shorter form um, uh, 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 periods where we can really bond the team and build cohesion rather than simply relying on people being in the same place at the same time over long periods. Thank you. I mean, a couple of questions coming in, spinning out of that, that discussion. One from uh, Jeremy Lee, who you know, is talking about those who have been vaccinated and those who perhaps haven't been vaccinated. Um, will you, are you, could you reasonably apply different approaches to people? We require a different, different policy that those who haven't been vaccinated you know, need to wear masks or can't come into the office, can work but can't come into the office, whereas those who have been vaccinated can. To what extent can you discriminate between those who have been protected and those who haven't? I would caution against that. Uh, and the reason for that is there will be some people who can't be vaccinated because they are medically vulnerable. Um, and uh, if we are denying opportunities to them, then we're going to run straight into disability discrimination arguments. Um, so uh, in principle, I can see problems. Now in practice, again, in particular environments, we may have to say it's better for uh, us in some defined way to get people back into the office. And because we have the opportunity to get some people back into the office more safely because they're vaccinated, we are going to bring them back in now. And I can construct a hypothetical where that might be the case. Uh, however, instinctively I'm cautious about that. If you can do it from the basis of need um, or a strongly evidentially supported desire, then let's talk about it. But it is not something to be done lightly because I can see all sorts of problems. Okay, I've got a uh, I've got a question from uh, Sarah here, but I, I'll 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 put that back till after this next question because I think we we can answer that in the context of the two sides of the equation, which is, you know, we. It, can we require people to come back in? Can we do, what about the reverse? Can we require people to stay at home? Can we abolish the office? Well, some organizations are already talking about doing that. Uh, some already have. And on the face of it, everyone wins. The employer saves the overhead. And if people have been working effectively from home so far then people are saying the commute and they don't have to go in and 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 it's 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 a complete win-win so it looks easier than the reverse requiring people to come in it's not though without its problems because there are some employees who find working in the office much easier uh, and we've talked about this, all organisations have talked about this. It, it, working from home is easier if you've got a big house or if you've got any sort of house or any sort of garden. And for, for young people starting out on the, 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 the flat shares, I mean, there's, there's, there's always the example, isn't there, of, of the, 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 the army morale problems in Northern Ireland started after the, the peace process and they stopped going out on patrol because all the barracks in Northern Ireland were built for troops who were going to be spending most of their time out on patrol, not on top of each other. And so there are some people who really want to get back into the office because it's much better working conditions than what they've got. And running in parallel with that is a decent working environment, a social working environment, could be part of the wage work bargain that every employer makes. That a nice place to work is part of your reward. That there's somewhere you enjoy coming to. 
that the social contact you get, that the relationships you get from the office, the friendships that you can make in the office are valuable to you. And I can see situations where employees will say, uh, if I'm not coming back into the office at all, that was part of the deal, I enjoyed that, I'm not working here anymore. Now, for many employers, there'll be a so what about that, there'll be just natural staff turnover, some people will like working this way, some people who won't, there's some people who won't. Um, uh, if you've got a sales force, for example, and you say, we don't need an office at all, um, and a salesperson says, well, actually being able to meet with the team, this is a really lonely job, I really enjoyed that, that was part of it, so that's it, I'm off. That is a constructive dismissal, and they then walk free of their non-competes, then you may have a problem. So it is easier to do it that way around, Michael, but it is not without risk, and you need to do it carefully. Thank you. And Sarah's question, she, I think she must work in, uh, in, uh, in a council. And she was saying that many councils don't have a specific location in their contract, or if they do, it's any council office in the borough, or you can work from home if it's agreed. Uh, and she's making the point that in the public sector in, in, in her area, that um, they're reevaluating their office space and wondering whether working from home is going to be the new norm uh, and indeed are possibly pointing to some um, <laughs> productivity improvements with people working from home uh, rather than the office. And, and her hanging question is whether we're picking up any, any different approach in the private sector compared to the public sector. I might add a bit at the end from our own approach, actually, if it, if it might be helpful, but I wonder... Jonathan, what um, what you've what you've observed? Um, I don't think we've seen trends to the same effect, actually. Uh, and it goes back to some of the things that that you've identified already around team cohesion. That that is valuable, uh, and the private sector is prepared to pay more through office space um, to, to gain the benefit from that. Now, it's not, I, I don't know a single organization. One possible exception, I bet you can think of as well, Michael. Um, but even there, I suspect the pressure from the workforce is going to be such that the old way is not coming back in the same form. So will offices be smaller? Almost certainly. Will people be spending less time in them? Almost certainly. I'm not seeing many or a private sector company saying, that's it, we abolish the office. That's not happening, not happening yet, no. Yeah, if I, and if, if I, might venture an opinion on that or certainly share some some things I'm just observing in the market. One is commercial property office letters aren't holding back. Um, they might be renegotiating some terms at the moment in the in the short to medium term to sort of hedge their bets. Um, but they are still pretty confident, certainly in their assessment of the market, but there's there's longevity in office office life in the medium term in, in any event. Um, I think certainly as an organisation ourselves, we're very being private sector and therefore very, very dependent on clients and client views and client reactions. Um, we're waiting to see on that. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's, I think there's some, there's some highfalutin press about how we're all going to live in some kind of hyperspace world and, and, and have, a, have a nirvana of everything, everything around us exactly as we need it. Um, uh, but actually, some of the early feedback we're getting from clients is that they are looking forward to the kind of personal interactions that, that the private sector uh, rightly ought to deliver for them as an experience. Um, whether it would be 100% in terms of how it was before, that all clients will want to go back to a personal relationship face-to-face -face with difficult issues with their lawyers, uh, if a jury is still out and I've, you know you will have seen various press reports from various organizations from goldman sachs to others saying that the you know the office is not dead they're big believers in all of this 
and certain types of work will lend itself, particularly, you know, heavyweight transactional work will lend itself to that kind of closeness, which will require an office. Um, that said, what you've said, Jonathan, about the workforce is, de is definitely true. Our own polls would suggest that the right now, the majority of our workforce, given the choice, would probably work two or three days a week in the office and the rest at home. It's just that actually nobody wants those days in the office to be Monday and Friday, um, uh, which causes some real problems for how you man the office. I mean, you know, do you have the office for the Wednesday or do you man it for, for Monday? Because the occupation will be very different uh, on those days. And the other thing that happens around the office is what do you how do you build your office if it's if it's a hybrid office, which, which is only partially full most of the time? Do you build it for individual working or do you build it for the kind of communal working opportunities you'd want to build into an occupied office in order to drive that collegiality and team spirit that you're looking to engender whilst whilst people are in the office? And actually, funnily enough, far from being flexible, we actually think it's going to be very inflexible because to have things working, people working together as you want, you actually need quite a degree of planning. You know, everybody needs to know that this team is going to meet on Wednesday at this time in order to ensure um, that, ev that everyone is in. The only other final thing I would say is everyone's looking at floor plate. You know, real estate costs money. Costs need to be passed on to clients. And are, are there are there opportunities to reduce costs to clients through reducing floor plate or using it more effectively? Um, there's so many things in the balance, I think. So in answer to your question, Sarah, uh, definitely the private sector is looking at it, but it's probably a bit more bit more jury out. Or I, I don't think it's running towards uh, uh, the remote office or the absolutely remote office. I think there's a few firms doing some experiments right now, and a lot of people are watching to see whether they'll work or not. That would be my my tuppenny worth. Um, the uh, Jonathan, I just um, so if we can abolish the office, how about people working abroad? I mean, you and I have had a couple of, of internal discussions uh, about this of late, to, with varying degrees of satisfaction. But uh, how about you know being able to work from abroad? Yes. Uh, and, and we've come across instances where uh, employers have discovered that that's actually what their people are doing already. They just weren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. In principle, once you can work remotely, then that can be from anywhere if you've got a reliable internet connection. However, however, there are, I think, practical and uh, jurisdictional issues. Um, dealing with the practical ones first, it is not true to say that you can work from anywhere with a reliable internet connection effectively with your colleagues, um, unless you're going to live your life in a very odd way. So, for example, someone saying, um, I want to work remotely from the West Coast of the United States, uh, is for their normal working hours in daylight not going to be at their desk at the same time as any of their colleagues in the UK because there's very little overlap in the working day. Now that might be an advantage. Uh, you can have your very own night shift in an organisation for example but in cases where you need regular interaction, easy interaction with the team that's not going to be practical be much easier though for somebody who's living on the east coast of the US because actually a lot of the working day then does overlap. Um, so setting aside those practical issues and you start to come on to the jurisdictional ones, um, there are issues for any manager in dealing with somebody who may be subject to a, a different form of employment law from the one that they're used to. It is possible that people who work in a particular location will have local employment law rights. So if I want to fire somebody for uh, uh, gross misconduct, then I might not be able to do it in the jurisdiction in which they're operating. They have rights against me. That will work on a very much on a, a, a jurisdiction to jurisdiction 
basis, you can't make any generalizations on this. Um, it is something though that needs to be looked at. But even before you get to that stage, I mean, that's an employment lawyer's first answer. Um, the payroll and uh, 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 general counsel will be saying, okay, two things. Well, what about their remuneration? What payroll deduction should we be making for somebody who's working in another country? Do we have to make social security contributions for them? Is that therefore going to be much more expensive to employ them there than it would be if they were in the UK? And also from the business risk perspective, uh, are we establishing a place of business in this new country? Are they therefore going to be uh, subject to uh, regulation as an entity of ours there and taxed as such? So all that needs to be worked through. It's not just as easy as having a reliable internet connection. And then if you're in a regulated industry, um, you start to have to look at issues such as, well, is the, 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 the place that you're working secure? Um, uh, and and that, that does become an issue in, in countries where the state can start prying around in your inbox much more easily than they can here. So uh, it is problematic, there's no question. It, it, it sounds like you know, we're released into a, a wonderful new world of possibilities where I can, I, can, I, I, I can achieve my charge by sitting in Timbuktu, not necessarily. We've now had, um, we've now had, well, dare I say, a year of this. This is a, this has been a year-long experiment in uh, in working from home, remote working. How, how's your, in your view, how's it all going in employment terms? Um, I think surprisingly well. I might put it that way. I mean, bearing in mind that this was a revolution in the industrial world. Um, and it's actually been surprisingly smooth from the employment law perspective. I, I don't want for a moment to minimize the impact that it's had on uh, individuals, um, not all of it good, uh, or, or indeed organizations, but, but looking at it from the narrow professional perspective, we haven't had that many problems thrown up at the moment, but as I trailed the beginning of this, I think there is one which is ticking and waiting to go off. Um, uh, and that is the way that the camera allows the employer access to areas of the employee's life that they've never had previously. In, in some ways, this way of working has brought opportunity. So if, if I can give you an example from, from, from my perspective, uh, we have in law firms, most of you on the call will have, have, have done this, you have the, 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 the seat system and people rotate through the departments. And because we don't have the opportunity for informal interaction with the trainees who are, who, are, who are coming through, you don't just pick stuff up at the water cooler or on the kitchen or at the workstation, then uh, uh, to try and overcome that, I have, have had a kickoff coffee with each of the trainees individually. Now, I wouldn't have done that in the office, and I wouldn't have done that because it probably wasn't necessary, and also because, uh, you know, as a, a male manager, I have to think quite carefully about positioning a one-to-one -one meeting with a junior woman. Because I mean, it's not saying you can't do it, but you just have to have to think carefully. And is it really worth the effort? No, probably not. You know, we're going to meet in the rest of it. So but now I get, to, you know, I can have a chat. It's fine because it's perfectly safe. They are in a home environment, and and it's 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 easy. Except, except that actually that one on one can be taking place in their home, and the the drawbridge is down. There is no barrier anymore between home and work. That sense of a place which was safe and separate has gone. 
so uh, I'm doing a call with someone in their bedroom. I notice a teddy bear and I start making, you know, remarks, I think, amused. oh, you don't still have one of those, do you? Um, or a book that they've got on their shelves or, or some item of clothing that's hanging up on the thing. And, and here you run into the problem that things that you would never say face to face because you are protected by the barrier of the glass and the screen, you forget that the, the communication is still there and intimate. It's like when we're behind the wheel of a car. I mean, I have um, said things to other drivers, uh, protected as I am by my screen, that I would never say to a pedestrian as I'm walking down the street. And so people can be less guarded on the camera, believe it or not. And, and then that can sound much worse for the employee because of the impact on them. That's their bedroom, okay? And I've been in their bedroom. And, and that, that safe space where work didn't come has gone. And I suspect that uh, there's a lot of clumsiness, um, possibly some intentional harassment that's been building up out there and we're not going to see the effect of that until we start to say to people, right, we want you back in the office. And people start making all sorts of excuses not to come back into the office because they don't want to be in the same room as the person who's already been in their room and abused the privilege. And I, 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 my crystal ball says we're going to have those, those problems. So if you get particularly um uh, uh women employees who are reluctant to come back in there needs to be a little sensitivity around that um don't you know okay, they're too young to have childcare responsibilities what's their point there might be something else to it we, we need to, to to watch out for that um, okay so watch for space uh we've got um eight questions so and we've only got probably just over 10 minutes if i may jonathan i'm going to skip to the audience questions now in in no particular order top golf is is asking this question that um as most lateral flow tests are are operated um the results are getting sent off to a central government uh you know central government website and coming up from that way so in that sense, just asking for confirmation, are we relying on employees to be honest about their results and then being expected to treat what they communicate to us in the same way as we would any other sensitive medical data? That might be a GDPR question, but... Um... Yes, I mean, and, and, and it is a, a GDPR question, and it is the, 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 the thing that I'm worried about, um, because... Uh, the employer will get the data from somewhere, whether there's an in-house testing facility on, on, on site or whether it comes back from the government. And then what do they do with that data once it's in there? So if one of the reasons that you're saying we want people to have a lateral flow test so that colleagues can be comfortable that everyone's safe, well, what then happens? Who needs to know that an employee hasn't had the test? Um, how, what do you do with that information when you've, when you've got it? There are really tricky data protection issues around that because is making colleagues feel better a reason for passing on highly sensitive information? And to what level do you do it in the company? How do you handle it? So that, that's, that, that's why when I answered the question, I said, there are all sorts of tricky GDPR <laughs> or data protection <laughs> issues around this. And why I really hoped I wasn't gonna to have to get into it in that level of detail. Um, but I, I think it, it does require the, those sorts of processes. You've got to ask yourself those questions. Why are we doing this? What are we doing with this data? How are we making sure it, it's, 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 it's safe? Who's got access to it? Why are they using it? And yes, the fundamental point being that actually in many cases you're relying on the employee. So how valuable is the data anyway? I mean, it, it's, they, those are all things you have to take into account. Um, in Sarah's organization, they are asking their employees whether they've been vaccinated or not and whether they're concerned about their health before they come into the office so that they can then take the appropriate and it sounds to me slightly personalized steps around how they're, how they're treated when they come into the office. Is, is that a sensible approach of engaging with individual employees about how they feel about stuff? Um, 
Like it, it, I, I, I hate answering any questions with the word. It depends because as we know, <laughs> we're all lawyers. All lawyers can answer any question with the words. It depends. And uh, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, we have to be very careful of this habit. Darling, does my bum look big in this? It, but you know, you can get into all sorts of trouble answering things with it depends, but I, I can't avoid it in this one. I mean, it's so context specific. Um, are you an organization where actually requiring people to be vaccinated uh, is a reasonable requirement? Healthcare, um, essential requirement, social care. Um, are you dealing with members of the public in very close proximity? Um, transport, travel, uh, the entertainment industry. And then where does that extend to? Retailing, the size of premises in the shop. It, it, it's, it's, it's such a fact specific issue. Um, at the moment, outside, the, 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 as, as I was saying when I was answering the, the, the question about Charlie Mullins, or, um, it, it, at the moment, um, outside health and social care, I would be very wary of an as an employer of imposing any sort of requirements or having any sort of dialogue around vaccines because it's going to be really hard to establish that that's a necessary thing to do. I can see that cascading through sectors in the economy and I can see it becoming a much more common question once we've completed the vaccine rollout, but not yet. Okay, so we've got a few questions, three questions, which I try and put together because of time on... on um tourism and travel actually so uh, actually given what you've just said you said health and care maybe is tourism one of those sectors where mandatory vaccinations might be better suited that's one question second question is how might work travel be affected can employees decline to travel uh, because of their concerns about the risks of going abroad to particular questions and then uh, how do mandatory quarantine periods affect uh, employees if you're sent away to have to go away to somewhere and then have to quarantine when you return are there any impacts falling out of that um well let me deal with that last one first because i think the answer is if your employer has asked you to go um abroad and you come then come back and you can't work um as a result of requirements which have changed your employer having required you to go then it will be a bold employer who is then going to, for example, dock your pay or penalise you for being absent in any way. Um, uh, I think the employer probably in those circumstances just has to suck it up and keep paying um, whilst you're in quarantine. Um, uh, it, it, it might be different for particular consultancy arrangements, for example, but in, uh, that would be my starting point on something like that. As to tourism and travel generally, um, yes, I do think that the case for compulsory vaccination will be easier to make further down the line in those sectors because of the um, close proximity to members of the public who are themselves in close proximity to one another. I can see that happening in order to fill the planes up. Um, as to travel to and from work, uh, this was a question which came up quite a lot in the first lockdown. Can we require people to come back to work? Because of course, um, we are under duty as employers, absolute duty to provide a safe system of work. And, and there was quite a lot of thinking, uh, uh, which was kicking around a year ago, that that extended to um, travel to work in the sense uh, that the, there's a specific um, section of the employment legislation where employers employees can refuse to come to work if they believe their health and safety is in danger and 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 that would include uh, if my travel to work exposes me then it's not reasonable of you to require me to come into work and I think that still remains the case actually this law hasn't changed the problem still remains the same what has changed and what will change through the vaccination program is whether that perception by employees is reasonable or not. Because the more of us are vaccinated, the more the R number drops. And the, the risk of any form of travel, even the tube, which must be some sort of device for the maximum effective spreading of viruses, is up and running again. 
it will still be relatively safe if people are all wearing masks and most of us have been vaccinated, uh, then it won't be unreasonable for an employer to say, no, you're fine. Um, and uh, one would hope at the relevant time that will be backed up by authoritative, um, uh, 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 scientifically based risk assessments on the various forms of, of travel and transport that exist. And partly because as a question of social acceptance, I don't see us all getting back on the tube and, and, unless we have to, until we know that it's safe to do so. Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're up against the clock now. So um, just to say, we've got a few questions which we've still got open and haven't answered. What we will do with those, uh, with the blessing of, of those who've asked them, I hope, is that we will we will give them uh, uh, written answers. Um, it's just, uh, it just falls to me to do two things. One is um, just to thank Jonathan. I'm hoping that perhaps at some stage I might see him uh, back in the office uh, in person. Uh, although I will, uh, if I'm not intruding on your privacy, Jonathan, I will miss that painting. I very much enjoyed looking at that painting for uh, for many, many, for many meetings we had over the over the lockdown period. Um, but this returning to the office point is obviously quite a significant issue for us in the Think House community uh, because we expect that by the autumn seminar. Uh, we will be able to do that in person if our audience would like us to do so. So I'm hoping uh, Susie in the background is, is working away with a very quick poll. Uh, if you've got time just to hold on just for a little bit, it would be really helpful if you could just let us know where you, where you would be on this. I'd appreciate that. We'll give it till 30 seconds, I think. Right. OK, well, I'll just leave I'll just leave that. I'll leave. I think I can leave that running uh, if you can continue to vote. Um, just to say a big thank you to all of you for joining uh, the webinar. We know you make choices around how you spend your time. So it's a real privilege for us that you choose to uh, share your time with us. So a big thank you uh, uh, for me and Jonathan. And just to share that we've got us as our second we webinar series coming up. In, on this Thursday on 10.30, uh, which for those of you who did raise questions about GDPR is about data sharing. Uh, so do join us for that at 10.30 this Thursday. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.